Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Katrina Glogowski. She's an angel investor and attorney to talk about Nectar Craft, the pitch deck up here and based in Seattle, Washington, a cannabis concentrate company and brand. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. So we're going to see if Nectar Craft can meet our seven tips to a successful investment deck being one, do they identify the business plan goals? Do they know their audience? Number three is, do they understand the market? Do they identify needs and roadblocks? Number five is if they know what sets the business apart, do they introduce the team and product? And finally, seven is, do they create a summary? Let's see if they can make it. See if they can get seven out of seven leaps here with Nectar Craft. They've got uh, CBD and THC. So, so Nectar Craft brings the first CBN and CBG products to market with an emphasis on novel routes to administrative and beautiful brand design to meet this demand. So what is Nectar Craft? They're a recreational cannabis brand in Seattle, Washington, offering premium cannabis products, including vape pens, oils, capsules, and salves. They use slow, natural, handcrafted methods developed through rigorous scientific exploration. Their process captures the essence of each variety of cannabis, which creates a flavor true to the aroma of the flower itself. And their mission is to plant respect through the integrity of its process, the true plants experience of its products and how it engages with the world. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure when this deck was, uh, was created. They've been around for, I don't know, at least a half a decade. I think they've been around since 2015, 2016. Uh, yeah, so Nectar's first uh, licensee, Circana, is no longer operating. Circana's total sales was $4.6 million. The majority of sales have been uh, Nectar brands, and in 2018 were 95% of Circana's sales. They're the Dope Cup winner for Best Concentrate Cartridge. They're in negotiations now with a new licensing fulfillment partner for Washington's I-502 uh, recreational market and ready to execute the CBN, CBG, and CBD online. Okay. Um, so it looks like they don't have a license any longer, uh, but they do have exist or previous sales uh, and are looking for different partners. So the next slide says who needs to relax. So that's going into CBN. So it looks like um, we want to get into some more rare cannabinoids. And they talk about the overall market, you know, separate THC from CBD as well as the unknown cannabinoids. There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So jumping into some of their assets, they have brand equity, they have federal trademarks in US and Mexico, standard operating procedures uh, for all THC containing products. They have packaging and collateral designed for their vape and concentrates, capsules, transdermal salves. They have third party vendors ready to create all products and fulfill orders with a comprehensive identity system for Nectar Craft and the budget and tonic library. I remember these people being in the store really early in in the in the legalized market in Washington. Uh, so I, I think that uh, this is interesting. Uh, I'm still a little confused as to what we're investing in, but let's see. Definitely not investing in the license. That doesn't look like they have that any longer, but there's been a, a lot of, of shuffle in Washington. So Willie's private reserve, they left. They're out of Washington. Um, and it looks like for whatever reason, they had a license they no longer do, uh, but maybe it's in the brand. I guess we'll find out what the ask is eventually. And so how can you make money if you invest or buy this, this particular brand? Uh, you can extend the Nectar Craft brand to become Nectar CBX, launch CBN, CBG, and CBD products online. They focus on business-to-business -business sales using uh, boots on the ground and influencers to reach alternative retail locations like tattoo parlors and spas, vape lounges, health stores, and license the Nectar Craft and Tonic Liberty brands into territories where THC is legal. Okay, so they're trying to sell a license to Nectar. Okay, I, I understand now. And so the ask, they're looking for a bridge round. So they're seeking a bridge of about 280,000 at a $1 million pre-money valuation to be used for ordering inventory to move from Washington to online sales, extending the Nectar Craft brand into online sales as Nectar CBX. 
You want to relaunch the brand in THC markets via licensing deals, bring full-time attention back to growth efforts and market aggressively using uh, getting them to the point where they're ready to raise additional funds at a significantly higher valuation, which is going to be rough in this market, especially right now <laughs> with, with everything absolutely taking a, a, a crash. I don't know if you saw Aurora closed yesterday at 86 cents. They're down 94% from its all time high. And so um, there's a, a major amount of value right now, whether it's publicly traded entities or just mom and pops here in the U S they're, they're going to be uh, discounted heavily. So um, if, if you're not already making sales, like we've said, it's going to be an uphill battle, but maybe this is a different play. Maybe it's for somebody who is already private labeling, who wants their own brand with standard operating procedures and how to create uh, you know, different oils and whatnot. Uh, there might be a play for somebody like that, maybe a European or, or Asian company that wants to, to grab somebody who's been, who has that experience. Uh, at a lower valuation than somebody who has that existing property plant and equipment. Not really sure what the play is or what the strategy is. Well, I like that they have a brand. It's a nice brand. Uh, the the packaging is 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 attractive. My concern is uh, they this is an older brand that somebody else used. And and what did their previous licensee do to the brand? Did did that relationship? destroy the brand, diminish the brand, affect the brand at all. So hopefully they address some of that in these other slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being familiar with the products and the brand, I've, I've gone and I've bought their products before a couple of years ago, um, has good products. I don't recall any kind of negativity uh, in the press or even the perceived from, from cu customers. Um, but again, it's just kind of like they, they fell off to the wayside. There's been some really good brands that for whatever reason have gone completely out of business. There was a disposable vape pen company that was first to market that in 2015. And they literally just kind of went, uh, went out of business. There was another coffee company, a beverage company that focused on coffee. Uh, they've since kind of just gone out of business, at least in Washington. They're doing really well in Oregon. Um, but it's kind of weird how companies kind of come in and, and go out for, for whatever reason. But it's definitely going to be something that an investor is going to want to ask and find out. I would want to know what the problems were with Circana uh, and, and figure out w why it failed with that previous licensee. So here's a timeline, 2015, they developed a portfolio for CBD and THC products and they won the Dope Cup. The Dope is now owned by High Times and is quarterly instead of monthly. I thought they just kind of dropped Dope entirely, but I just found out that they have a new uh, magazine issue. <laughs> and so to my surprise, they're still around. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think they've lost all of their relevancy. Uh, I'm talking about Dope magazine. Uh, so they have a federal trademark that was awarded sometime after 2016. And then in 2017, they began sourcing and testing CBG. It's probably a good year, uh, two years before that became available uh, wholesale. Uh, CBN in 2018 was launched in Washington, ahead of the time as well. They started seeking funding last year uh, to launch their brands online. And then 2020 phase two for existing sales, uh, showing brand equity licensing to licensed brand and THC partners. Um, and so they're looking to raise a series A. Okay. So they're trying to go after the, the legal market, uh, the CBD, the, the um, retail stores and the THC market. That's interesting because uh, they're two very different uh, directions of, of planning. So that's interesting. So their phase two for a series A round, uh, they mentioned Ambrosia Holding Company. So upon a series A funding, Ambrosia Holding acquires Nectar Craft in exchange for stock in Nuco, which is Ambrosia Holding Company. Ambrosia acquires the rights to build from scratch three to four additional brands. Using shared resources, Ambrosia takes advantage of the lessons and economies of scale established with the Nectar team to reach demographics outside of Nectar and additionally target markets for other brands, including the sports fans, people who want more pharma or nutraceutical approach and hipsters. 
And then the house of brands becomes an appealing target for acquisitions by players who have lots of infrastructure to produce and want to increase their business to consumer sales. I, I like that they're being open about the fact that uh, they have a separate holding company and they're, they are very clear about their plans of what they're going to do. So that's good. So breaking down the numbers, revenue and EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. Looks like the average margin online, 62% and percentage of gross profit spent on marketing was one fifth. So their sales have been increasing from year two, three, and four, and uh, EBITDA just kind of slowly creeping up there as well. So they do mention the team. They've got the CEO and chief marketing officer. So that's good that they've included some of the team members. I always like to see people I know. <laughs> and then we end with that. So we don't necessarily have a, a a review at the very end, but it does seem like uh, they've got an ask of what, 280,000 with a $1 million pre-money valuation. So let's see, out of the seven tips to a successful investment deck, do they, do they identify the business plan goals? I think they do. They, they outline what they wanna do and why they need the money. So I, I think they do identify the goals of the company. I would agree with that. Do they know their audience? If they, if the audience is an investor, they didn't really give too much information. I mean, this is high level and it's always good to be high level and not give away the secret sauce sometimes. Uh, but a lot of the information around financials that they did provide were, were fairly dated in. I don't really think that they hit it out of the park as far as investor audience. If they're going after the CBD type audience, um, they didn't really set their brand apart at all. Um, being, being early in the market with CBN and CBG, uh, they're not the only ones. So I'll give them a half a point on Know Your Audience, Josh. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I know um, that the brand and the, and the people behind the brand understand the market, but I don't think that they express that through this deck that's probably a year old i'm guessing that this deck was made uh, was made in 2019 i'm assuming um, so i'll yeah. give them half a point because uh i think they they tried to get the point across but very briefly mm -hmm. um, understanding the market uh i think that they made a pretty good point about cbn and cbg and some of these more rare cannabinoids and, and doing it early and in some cases, a couple of years earlier than the the sheep. <laughs> some of the people I see on on LinkedIn kind of pushing CBG now, they were doing that several years ago. And I like their plan to have a holding company for different brands uh, in order to have different price points and different focuses. For example, the sports uh, marketing type thing is going to be totally different than the nutraceutical type thing. So. I'll, I'll give them a point there. And so number four is identifying needs and roadblocks. Um, they did identify what they need, which was money. I, I think they missed out on some of the roadblocks, um, like finding a license and, you know, just typical roadblocks that you encounter sort of left out. One of the big things that they left out is the FDA regulation of the CBD, CBN, CBG market. Uh, they did not address any of the regulatory hurdles that could encounter uh, with this market. Uh, and for example, the FDA says you can't ship CBD uh, across state lines. Mm -hmm. Does it happen every day? Yes, it does. Is CBD on the shelf at who? at Whole Foods? Yes, it is. Uh, is it gonna continue to be on the shelf at 7-Eleven? Probably, but they didn't even address the regulatory market. Uh, and so if the plan is for uh, Nectar Craft to sell the brand or license the brand to a white label company or, or uh, be bought out by an existing company, that's one thing. 
But if their plan is to try and put of their own nectar craft products on amazon.com uh, to sell them online, they did not address the roadblocks that they face at all. Uh, I, I struggle with their with that because they weren't clear, first of all, what their actual plan was. Uh, but second, a lot of companies say, hey, it's on the shelf in 7-Eleven today. That means it'll be on the shelf in 7-Eleven tomorrow. Uh, that's just not the case. And, and I really think it's a weak point for people to not identify that possibility of FDA cranking down on CBD. Mm -hmm. uh, as an investor, I'm not investing for today or tomorrow. I'm investing for next year. And um, I just don't like it when companies fail to identify that roadblock because it is significant. With what they do have, did they meet half of that with identifying needs or did they miss out entirely on that, number four? Well, they said they need a licensee and they need money, which are needs. Uh, and currently they can produce these products. So I'll give them a half a point, okay. but it is, it, from an investor standpoint, it is significant when any company fails to address the regulatory roadblocks. So with number five, knowing what sets the business apart, is it enough to mention that they have federal trademarks and have early uh, experience with some more minor or rare cannabinoids? I like that they mention that. I like that they talk about uh, the, the new verbiage of CVX because these, these compounds are being discovered every day. I like that they are planning for expansion to the other uh, cannabinoids. Uh, I like all of that. Uh, I like that they are a brand. Uh, they had sales previously. Uh, this is exact. This is a product. This is not an idea per se. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd give them number five. And do they introduce the team and product? I think we saw yeah. all of those slides. And creating a summary. I didn't see a summary call to action, uh, and and that is that is a missed opportunity in, in your very last slide. You know, call me now or, or something. Or, you know, if you if you have questions, contact me. Something uh, that that spurs the reader of the pitch deck into action. Uh, I didn't see that. So adding all of that up, I think they got five out of seven leaves. That's not bad for such a, a uh, short pitch deck. Um, not bad knowing, at all. Yeah, not bad at all. Knowing what you know, would you uh, invest in this company? What's your take? I like the fact that they are trying to uh, have a holding company that addresses both CBD and THC. Uh, we've seen this. Uh, Oleo is, is trying to do the same thing uh, and license the THC piece so they don't ever touch the flower and focus on producing the, the CBD and, and associated derivatives um, because that's a legal market. Uh, I, I like that. I would definitely ask some questions. Um, and again, I think I stated earlier uh, what happened with the last licensee. Um, you know, there's a lot of valid reasons to break up with your previous licensee. Uh, but now I just have a question mark. You know, what happened? Did the brand not sell? Uh, they did say uh, that uh, Nectar was something like 95% of, of Circana's sales, but 95% of how many sales? Uh, was it just a bad deal? Did, you know, parting of the ways, what happened? Uh, and I'm primarily looking for, um, a justification that it wasn't Nectar's fault, the, the brand's fault. Uh, so maybe just like a little asterisk there, you know, parting of the ways uh, and it, it was unsuccessful or mismanaged or, or whatever. Uh, but that is a big roadblock for me right there because that's what they're trying to do now. They're trying to license with somebody else after the first one failed. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, and I would want to know also what the failure rate is on the carts when they were selling them. To my surprise, I just bought 
two carts, a hybrid and uh, an Indica from a very reputable company that's been around for a long time. And I had to return the hybrid because it, it wouldn't pull. I couldn't, I couldn't get a draw out of it. And then the Indica, um, you know, last night I tried pulling off and I thought maybe my battery was dead, fully charged, still wouldn't work. So now I have to go return the Indica one today. And I, hopefully it's still within the warranty because I bought it last week. So anything over a week, then I'm totally screwed. So yeah. that's like circa 2015. I mean, the, the company is reputable and that's why I pay uh, more than 100% more. I pay more than double what I would uh, with, a, with a syringe or tanker um, at $18 for one gram. Instead, I'm paying uh, you know $40 for a cartridge and they're still clogging, which is crazy stupid uh, in 2020. So I want to know what the failure rate is. There's a few questions I have. Um, but nectar craft aside, Washington State is a petri dish shithole experiment. And I wouldn't advise anybody to do business in Washington State. Having said that, if you are already in California, why not grab the whole West Coast? And so maybe that's a, that's a, a, an option. It's definitely a strategy some companies use to say, oh, we're in X amount of states and they just have like one SKU in Washington and they don't care if it sells. So maybe that's an advantage. I would take the federal trademarks. I'd take the standard operating procedures and what they've gone through because that's invaluable to a lot of companies in New York, <laughs> East Coast. Go to Massachusetts, go to a, a, a medical state and take your, your IP and take your experience and run with it because it's worth a lot more over there than it is over here. Uh, except for the the exception of somebody who just wants to have a, a representation in the state without caring about the total sales numbers. Uh, I think there's something here. I just don't know how to value it. Yeah. And, and I think you have a valid point. Um, the, the fact that a, a stumbling block occurred could actually be a selling point. You, you know, we went through this and we stumbled, but this is what we learned. And this is what we're going to do this time. And I, I never even thought about the possibility of going into a medical state and saying, this is how you do it right. <laughs> and, and we know. <laughs> yeah, because you're incredibly naive if you think you're going to do it without encountering any issues. It's like building a house and thinking you're not going to have some kind of obstacle or, you know, if you've ever remodeled anything, it never goes as planned. You know, yeah, so right. you have to plan for the unplanned and, and cannabis industry is no different. So I would much rather grab somebody who's already done it, especially ones that have had difficulties because those that haven't, haven't learned enough. And so from a brand like this, I think having the experience uh, is definitely a selling point as long as the valuation makes sense. Uh, I think there's a lot to offer whether you've succeeded or not. Um, there's a lot of those companies that just, you know, whether it's a soda company or cartridge or, or otherwise, there's a, there's a lot of failed companies that could add value to, um, you know, onboarding states like Massachusetts or a Philly or New York or Florida. Um, but again, back to you know, what, what is, what is the valuation? What is it worth? And so maybe there's some, some wiggle room there, but I would definitely take a look at their SOPs and see if it makes sense for another state. Right. Well, good. Good luck to them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Glogowski. She's an angel investor and attorney in Seattle. Thanks for getting back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out.